of this uh, uh, halfway transformation. So uh, in the first part of the lecture today, I want to really complete the kinematic discussion um, uh, that we've been having by talking about the other symmetry, uh, which is going to play an important role in this uh, which is the dual conformal symmetry that we're supposed to create. And uh, a byproduct of this, as you'll see, has nothing to do with n equals 4, has nothing to do with uh, anything. It's just a super awesome set of variables uh, with which to describe the... That's not a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the of the word super, really awesome set of variables, uh, just to describe the kinematics of external particles. Okay. And, um, and, and as we'll see, uh, uh, these are the kind of the best variables of all um, in order to just describe just the kinematics of n external particles that are massless and conserved momentum. Well, let's just uh, start off talking about it uh, um, by, by remembering what this dual space is, right? So the idea is that um, uh, we have n particles, and there's a natural cyclic ordering for them. One, two, three, up to n. That's it. So because there's a natural cyclic ordering, we can draw their momentum on, on a four-dimensional sheet of paper, end to end to end. And if we do that, the fact that they conserve momentum is encoded in the fact that these make a closed polygon. So if I call this space x, maybe I'll be a little pedantic and call it x dual so that we don't forget put the d down here, then this is a space in which the momenta for the eighth particle is given by x dual a plus 1 minus x dual a, where the x's are now just the coordinates dual 1, 2, up to x dual n, just the coordinates of the edges of this polygon. Okay? So just drawing this polygon immediately, drawing any old polygon, immediately generates a bunch of momenta that add up to 0, trivially, by this picture. Right? That's not quite what we need a little bit more. So that this, if I write this formula down, I'm generating a bunch of numbers pa that add up to 0, a bunch of ve four vectors pa that add up to 0. So that trivializes momentum conservation. We've already talked about how to trivialize the fact that things are on shell. We write p equals lambda lambda tilde. So we know how to trivialize the things that things are on shell and momentum conservation. But at this point, we still don't know how to trivialize both. Okay? So in other words, if I say p equals lambda lambda tilde, that's fine. But then I have to impose a constraint by hand that the momenta add up to 0. Or I could do this, but then I have to impose by hand that the x's are null separated from each other. That's just a side comment because we're going to solve that problem. What, the thinking about symmetries is going to solve that problem very, very beautifully in, in a second. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, remark on that. OK, but anyway, the dual conformal transformations are the conformal transformations in this space. Okay? And it's a very non-trivial fact that the amplitudes appropriately defined, and I'll tell you what appropriate means in a second, are actually invariant under conformal transformations, in fact, super conformal transformations in this space. This is a second conformal symmetry. There's the obvious conformal symmetry. There's a second conformal symmetry. And the two of them together generate this infinite dimensional algebra known as the Yangian, which I'll have slightly more to say about later. But we're just still doing kinematics. So, uh, so but now notice that the variables that we're interested in are really the space-time points here. Okay? So now the connection, so since we have conformal transformations, we should talk about twister variables. right? So how should we talk about um, so it's, it's natural to introduce, uh, to introduce twister variables. OK, so let's do it. So that point in space-time is associated. So this is a space-time picture now. So from now on, I'm not going to keep saying dual space-time. Okay? This is a space-time picture. And now let's just see what, this, what does this polygon look like in twister space. It's very simple. Let's took that point. That point is a line in twister space. There it is. Okay? That point is another line in twister space. Now, these two points are null separated from each other. So what did we learn that that meant back in twister space? It means that the line that's associated with each one, that those two lines intersect. Okay? 
So that means, so this is the, this is the line corresponding to x1. The line corresponding to x2 is some other line that intersects that. Okay. That's the line with x3, x4, x5, x6. So what we have associated with that picture of the polygon in, in, the, in space time, of this null polygon in space time, is a picture in twister space of just a whole bunch of lines. One intersecting the next, intersecting the next, intersecting the next. OK? Is that clear? Huh? It's not a polygon. No, no, it's absolutely not a polygon because there's no meaning of going from here to there. It's all projective. So I'm drawing these things as lines. It's perfectly fine to think of them as lines. Everything, that's, that's fine. They're complex lines, but they're complex lines. Each one of them is a little sphere. <laughs> okay, this is a little sphere. It's a little sphere if you want to think of it like that. And furthermore, there's no notion of this being, this is between here and there. You know, this is all one thing. They just happen to intersect. Okay, this intersects here, that intersects there, and so on. It's not a polygon. If you had a real section. Uh, if we had a real section with some even choice of what we mean by some orientation, we would have it. Because even, and it's not orientable. So anyway, but there is some way of doing it, but let me, let me not uh, talk about that. It's not useful to think of it as a polygon. It's really useful to think of it as a bunch of lines. Yes? Suppose that you start with a theory which is not controlled by the Yes. Yes, yeah, so you see, th th this, is, this is one nice point already. And this is why these variables are useful even for totally non-conformal theories. I'm not even talking about dynamics at this point. I'm simply talking about having massless particles. See, this is just a point. Having n massless particles, independent of whether the dynamics is conformal or not, that kinematics is conformal, <laughs> enjoys a conformal transformation, enjoys a conformal symmetry, and that's why it's useful just kinematically to introduce these, so this space. So yes, no, then, way. right. Then, then, we have to, then we have to deform this somehow, and there are some things we can do, but, uh, but let's, let's defer that discussion. Okay. Yes? Can this happen that so the first line intersects the third line? No, because, no, no, because, just because, I mean, just because in this picture I'm demanding that this is null separated from that, it's null separated from that, it's null separated from that. Okay? It might be if you can make a further non-generic choice to make it so that this is also null separated from that. In that case, you would have to take this configuration of lines, and then that's a special configuration that makes them further self-intersect somewhere. Okay, and that would, right. Uh, as you featured it, they yes. all intersect No, 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 no. This is in CP3, okay? These are, again, think of it, think of it in three dimensions. You, you can think about these things fruitfully as lines in ordinary three-dimensional space. Okay, so here's a line, there's another line, there's another line. They can intersect. Huh? They can intersect more they times. But they don't have to. They, they certainly, and they do not generically. This is why, because of the pain of the blackboard, I, even though these are lines that go out forever, I draw them like this in order precisely not to draw this tangled mass of crap because uh, they don't really just take it anyway. You see, I told you, you didn't play pick up sticks as a kid, and so you have problems with this, you know. <laughs> Okay, very good. Now actually, there's an even simpler way of giving exactly the same data. Namely, just give these intersection points. So here I'm gonna give some Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, okay? In other words, if I just hand you endpoints in twister space, Z1, Z2, Z3, then I can build this line, z1, z2, z2, z3, z3, z4, by construction, it's such that one line intersects the next. Okay? So that's very beautiful now, because I can just give you n completely unconstrained twister variables, these z's, and they are gonna automatically produce for you what? A bunch of on-shell momenta that add up to zero. So, so let's say that, that uh, so I'm saying that if we're going to associate the point xi or xa, I'm going to associate it with the line za plus 1 or za, za minus 1, let's say. Right? So is that clear? Remember, there's a correspondence between a point and a line in, in, in Twister space. And now I leave this as a tiny exercise for you, given that I've, I told you the general formula for how to associate a point in Twister space with a, 
with uh, uh, a point in space time with a line, right? For any z a, z b, there was the point x a b, which was, whose coordinates was mu a lambda b, mu, mu a lambda b minus mu b lambda a over a b, okay? So that tells you each one of the points. And then you can construct the momentum from them by taking x a plus one minus x a, right? And so having done that, you, you will then see that each one of the momenta looks like some lambda, lambda tilde, and then, so we get some formula for lambda and lambda tilde. So that's a very small bit of algebra exercise that you can do yourself, so let me tell you what the answer is. So if the z's are written as lambda and mu, lambda a and mu a, and via this correspondence we get the points in space time and then the momenta, what we have are, are momenta, which are lambda a, lambda tilde a, where the lambda a's are not coincidentally the same lambdas, but the lambda tilde a is given by the following very pretty little formula. a minus 1 a, mu a plus 1, plus cyclic, a plus 1 a, mu a minus 1, plus a minus 1 a, uh, oops. Uh, plus, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a, a plus 1, a minus 1, mu a, plus a, a plus 1, mu a minus 1, over a minus 1, a, a, a plus 1. Okay? So all these things are the brackets made out of the lambdas. Okay? So in other words, we have lambda a and lambda tilde a given by this formula. And so now the claim is that if I hand you random mu a and lambda a, you shove into that formula, you get a bunch of lambda, lambda tildes that conserve momentum automatically. That's another very small exercise for you to do. Prove that with this form, the sum of lambda, lambda tilde is equal to zero. It's very easy to do. The main thing that you've got to know is that any two-dimensional vector can be expanded in a basis of any other two-dimensional vectors. You'll notice that this just involves the nearest neighbors of A, the two nearest neighbors of A, and there's a tiny little identity which is so, a, a tiny little identity that, which just follows from the fact that if you have, let's say you have a bunch of two-dimensional vectors, VA, VB, and VC. Let's call them mu A, well, let's say lambda A, lambda B, lambda C, the fact that it can expand C in the basis of B and A uh, is the identity that A, B, lambda C plus cyclic C, A, lambda B plus B, C, lambda A is equal to zero. It's called the Schouten identity. Probably uh, Zvi talked about this. Totally trivial fact that you can expand a two-dimensional vector in terms of two other two-dimensional vectors. You would be amazed how important this fact is. <laughs> over and over and, and, and over again in, uh, uh, in, in, in this business. But anyway, this little identity uh, you, you can use to directly prove that these things uh, automatically conserve momentum. So they satisfy the sum of lambda a lambda tilde equals zero. So am I being, is everything clear so far? Okay. Now, of course, nicer than that, Again, notice that lambda tilde a has the opposite weight as lambda a, normally, under this uh, little group scaling that we talked about. But now mu a and lambda a have the same weights. And that's, that's exactly correct, because z, which is lambda mu, okay? indeed, we have z is equivalent to tz. Okay? So once again, there are points in CP3. It's a twister space, everything exactly the same as we were talking about before. But here, going from momentum space, which turns into this dual coordinate space, to twister space involves no Fourier transformation or nothing funny, just that little algebraic operation. That's all. Someone hands you a function of lambdas and lambda tildes, you can immediately just turn it into a function of lambdas and mu's, just by doing that. Just an algebraic substitution. Okay? But the beauty is that now, lambda and mu together should be this nice four-dimensional vector. And if the theory has a conformal symmetry, it should act as SL4 on that four-dimensional vector, okay? 
Now, uh, I won't have time to, uh, to approve this, uh, but it'll look very, very plausible to you. Remember, this thing trivializes momentum conservation. Uh, in every supersymmetric theory, we also have the superpartner of momentum conservation, which was that the sum of lambda a, a to tilde a has got to equal zero. If you remember from last time, we had this delta eight sum of lambda a, a to tilde a, which was the counterpart to the sum of lambda, lambda tilde, okay? So it would also be nice to trivialize this, the superpartner of momentum conservation. That means that we should have some formula for the a to tildes in terms of some new variables that automatically guarantee that the sum of lambda eta tilde is equal to zero. And then it won't surprise you that it's that variable on which the SL4 slash 4 acts nicely. So that formula is just literally the same as this one. So I will complete it up here. We then also say that the eta tilde a's are equal to uh, uh, a minus 1a, some new variable, which I'll call, unfortunately, there's, there are too many spaces here, so I'll call it eta again. Eta uh, a plus 1 plus uh, a plus 1, a minus 1, eta a plus a minus 1, a, eta a plus 1 over a minus 1, a, a, a plus 1. These things are grouped into a super momentum twister whose top components are bosonic or lambda and mu and whose bottom components are these etas, okay? And exactly the same algebra that shows that this trivializes momentum conservation shows that that trivializes momentum conservation, uh, super momentum conservation, yeah. Sorry? It's, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm screwing up, cycling things over. Plus a, a plus one, sorry. A to a minus one, thank you. The numerator is just one guy plus cyclic, okay? All right. So now, again, it's a literally an algebraic operation now. So the claim is that if you take any amplitude for any KNN, which is a function of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde, okay? You substitute lambda tilde equals that, eta tilde equals that, okay? The claim is that if you do that, that this is equal to, first of all, now notice something very important. These formulas only make sense on the support of momentum conservation, right? They're forcing momentum conservation, okay? So it's clear that whatever we're doing, we need to, uh, it, they're there anyway. We have this momentum conservation. We have the super partner of momentum conservation. Let's, for fun, factor out this factor that we saw in this k equals 2 uh, tree amplitude. The reason to do that, this now takes care of all of the weights, okay? So now anything we, we, we write is gonna have no weight under rescaling uh, any of the variables, okay? So, but just think of this as is the delta function, the dimensionless, the weightless uh, uh, generalization of what we normally do, which is just a factor out momentum conservation, okay? So the claim is that if we do this, that the function that's left over, which we can call rnk, now of course we do this and the function that's left over is also a function of lambda, lambda, tilde, and eta, tilde. But the claim is it's not any old function of lambda, uh, lambda, tilde, and eta, tilde. They actually regroups into being directly a function of z. In such a way that this function is invariant under this SL4 slash 4 that acts on the z variables, okay? So that is a sense in which a theory is, has dual conformal symmetry, okay? You take the scattering amplitude, it's not itself dual conformal invariant, the whole dual space doesn't even make sense without momentum conservation. So you have to strip off the momentum conservation together with its super partner and this factor that makes everything dimensionless. But the claim is that after you do that, the function that was a priori just a function of the lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde magically regrouped itself to be a function of these twister variables. And it's something, it's, it's a magic that when you see it in front of your eyes, looks, looks astonishing. You have these very complicated expressions. Then you substitute in this, 
And all of a sudden, you see that everything collapses to be beautifully functions of four brackets that are built out of these uh, objects and, uh, and supersymmetric friends of them. Okay. So that is the sense in which Yang and Mills, or people screwing around with uh, computing uh, uh, tree scattering amplitudes, just in ordinary Yang Mills theory, could have discovered something like dual conformal symmetry. It was sitting there. You could do these little changes of variables, but wham, you do it, and all of a sudden, things only depend on, on the external data in terms of these four brackets. And there's this new SL4 symmetry that you didn't know anything about. Yes? Uh, here, yes. Yes, so, so, so um, if, I can, if I can defer some of this discussion to later, let, let me say the, the, concrete, the concrete statement. Every object, which is, every object which is perfectly well-defined, for example, all the leading singularities are perfectly well-defined, they're all flat-out invariant. There's no anomaly, there's no nothing, they're just invariant. The integrand to all loop orders is flat-out invariant. So there are things that are flat out and very, the question of what the anomaly looks like is a very interesting question that's starting to be understood. In other words, the right hand side, so, so naively you have a Q bar amplitude equals zero. There are these little anomalies associated with infrared effects and so on, which tell you that the right hand side should not be zero, but it should have, be very constrained by, by descent equations and so on, okay? So people are starting to figure out what the right hand sides look like. And they have very beautiful properties and interpretations, and we could talk about it some more. It has not been fully, fully figured out yet, but there's beginning to be an understanding of what the, what the correct, in other, another way of saying it is how do you, yeah, the symmetries at the level of final answer do have these anomalies. And uh, so there's starting to be some understanding for how to characterize it, but it's not completely complete yet. Well, yeah. is, yes, yes. Oh, sorry, in this way, oh, that's right. In this way, if you literally do with the whole amplitude and not the integrand, if you, if you strip this out, you'll find this thing is almost invariant. <laughs> and then it'll, uh, the, it'll have some little divergences, and, uh, but, 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 but what it's not invariant up to is very universal. So it's the usual sort of thing that happens with the anomaly. You see, up to some simple to characterize universal factors, it is invariant. <laughs> that's if you literally do it on the answer with the polylogs and everything, okay? But if you do it for leading singularities or the integrand, it's just flat out invariant. Okay, but any questions about this? But uh, as I say, th this is actually a small godsend to people who you know, have to generate on-shell momenta that, that conserve, that on-shell objects that conserve momentum just numerically. I mean, it's a very tiny thing, but normally you have to do a bunch of them and then you know, solve some equations. It's just very nice to just be able to give a bunch of un unconstrained variables and immediately build something. Uh, let me make a small comment because uh, you might be a little confused that we're getting something for nothing. Um, I just told you we have a whole bunch of unconstrained variables, right? But how can that be? I mean, after all, naively we have lambda and lambda tilde, so there's there's four n variables there, or okay, there's there's four n variables, but there's four constraints, so there's momentum conservation, right? Four n minus four. Well, here we just have four n variables. What's going on? What happened to the constraint? What's going on is that this map is not invertible. Okay? I can, given lambdas and mu's, I can solve for lambda and lambda tilde, but not vice, vice versa. And that's totally obvious, because if I just go back to the picture of the polygon, the origin is totally undetermined. <laughs> I can translate the whole picture, and nothing changes. Right? So there's a redundancy, just translating everything. And that redundancy just is precisely reflected here. It's four degrees of freedom. right? The, the reason that this redundancy doesn't matter is that, quite nicely, this translation redundancy is part of the SL4 conformal symmetry that the answer has. So the answer doesn't depend on the origin. In fact, the translations and everything else group up into the whole big dual conformal symmetry. But it shows you that part of this dual conformal symmetry, the translations, is trivial, is a redundancy. Okay? All right? Yes? Right. Right. Exactly, and that's the. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. 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 Uh, it has uh, not been. Believe it or not, this problem has not been. I, I, I've thought about this off and on for for uh, for a number of years, and it doesn't have a very. It doesn't have a particularly simple answer. Uh, this is really the obstruction we were talking about over lunch. That, uh, that you, can always, you can always do it, but 
You can always do it, but it's really massively, yes, yeah. In fact, let, let, me, tell you, let me tell you what a completely permutation invariant formula would be. Okay, this is just a small aside, but exactly the little identity that, that, that I wrote before tells you that you should actually write lambda a is equal to, say, b, a, b, uh, mu a, b, c, b, c, summed over b and c. Okay? Okay. So, so if I introduce variables lambda a and mu a, b, c, okay? And perhaps you could put an A, B, B, C, C, A here if you like. Okay? Then that trivializes momentum conservation. Okay? But we've introduced a gigantic number of extra variables, right? I mean, uh, not just four, but something. Just, just, just indices, yeah. So, so, so mu A, B, C has got to be anti symmetric. Okay? That's right. Well, actually, when, when, when I write this, mu ABC should be symmetric, but should vanish if, if indices are, are, are equal to each other. Okay? So it, it's just a function of a distinct triple, A, B, and C. So you take a function of a distinct triple, A, B, and C, you write this formula down, and it trivializes momentum conservation. Okay? But it's got a huge redundancy, really huge redundancy, and controlling that redundancy is very hard. So somehow, in the yeah. Yeah, it, it generates light-like things that, who's, that, that conserve momentum. So these should be nice variables for gravity, for example, because it doesn't break permutation symmetry. Okay. But uh, uh, you can uh, ask my poor tortured students. Uh, uh, something nice happens with these variables, but not enough to uh, make it, not enough so far to be worth talking about at a school, which I've done for three minutes, unfortunately, but yeah. Oh, it, uh, it, there's no twisterial interpretation to this. And there shouldn't be, because there's no conformal symmetry. No. We're, right. this, is just, this is just a nice set of variables that trivialize momentum conservation, just algebraically. Right. And but they're way too redundant. Somehow, the cyclic, yeah. What is the constraint that given on the UABC gives you Oh, just, just, just that ABC only depends on consecutive triples with a cyclic ordering. That's all. That turns into that, yeah. You see, this is exactly of this form, right? This is exactly of that form where A, B, C, for a given A, A, B, C is only non-vanishing for A minus 1, A, A plus 1. Huh? Oh, I, I didn't, th th this was just the lambda tilde formula. We could write the similar formula for A to tilde, okay? This is just the analog of the formula, of this formula, getting the lambda tildes from the mu's. So, so, so it's an interesting little challenge for, a, it sounds incredibly simple, but come up with nice <laughs> variables which make momentum conservation obvious. If you succeed in doing this in a way that's nicer than this, then I guarantee you'll make a lot of progress with thinking about gravity amplitudes, okay, which I haven't been talking about. What's not this way? <laughs> well, this way accounts for n minus those ways. No, 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 well, I don't know. This is a, the, the, this is an obvious way of doing it, and I'm telling you that it's, uh, it's so redundant that it's not useful. There may be other ways of doing it, and I don't know the answer, so the answer is I don't know. I don't know, I don't know the answer to the question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, um, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes. Oh, the slash four is going to be incredibly important in, in, one, in, in, in a moment. You'll see from this different point of view why, why, totally different point of view, why supersymmetry is crucial. Actually, uh, this is something I think some algebraic geometers know, like Pierre Deligne knows very well. Supersymmetry is awesome for algebraic geometry for a reason that will become totally manifest in, in a second. They should love algebraic geometry, and a few of them are starting to love it more and more. Uh, and, um, so, but, and, and you'll see why. You'll see precisely why in a second. Supersymmetry, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Right. No, 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 it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not like that. No, because it's not at all, no, it isn't like that. But you'll see the point of, you'll see, you'll see a totally different reason why supersymmetry is so nice in a moment. Okay, 
Now, again, I could show you explicit examples of, of taking an amplitude and doing this and seeing this magic happen, but I'm going to defer it uh, until we finish our little introduction to the Grassmannian now. Okay? Because all these things will be much easier to write down when we have this technology at our disposal. But the claim is clear, I hope, right? Okay. Okay. So now we, we have all the kinematic variables that we need. We're talking about all the symmetries that are going to make an appearance in the nicest possible way. So now I'm going to make a, a little jump. Okay? And I'm just going to make this jump to introduce a sort of new set of objects and a new set of things that we're going to be thinking about. Uh, and, then, and then I'll make another jump of uh, forgetting about physics altogether and starting, as I said, from some uh, pictures about permutations and working our way back to seeing where all this uh, comes from, from another point of view. Okay? But, but for the moment, I'm still, uh, I'm still being a physicist. Um, but, uh, but I want to ask the following, but let's say we just want to take some inspiration. Somehow we want to write a theory for the amplitudes directly. There's no space time. We don't want to write down Lagrangians. What should we do? Okay, let's just try to do it. Let's just try to start. Uh, and I'm going to start by thinking about something. So let's forget about this dual conformal symmetry and all this stuff. I, I want to start, let's go back to space time, good old fashioned space time, scattering, and so on. What I want to think about is, uh, uh, in a slightly new way, is, well, before talking about momentum conservation, <laughs> I want to talk about something even more basic. Let's try to visualize in a new way visualizing the external data. By the external data, I just mean, you know, let's for, even forget about supersymmetry for a second. I just have a bunch of lambdas and lambda tildes, right? But I want to visualize them in a slightly different way now. So we, we normally think of these as just a bunch of two-dimensional vectors. There's a two-dimensional, another one, another one, another one, right? I want to think about it a slightly different way. Each one of these is a two-dimensional vector. So let's take the top component of the lambda vectors, let's say. There's a bunch of numbers there, right? Top component one, top component two, and so on. Those are n numbers. So they make an n-dimensional vector. So let's draw them in an n-dimensional space. Okay. So here is the Lorentz component equals one piece of all the lambdas taken together, they make an n-dimensional vector in an n-dimensional space. Okay? The A equals two Lorentz components make some other n-dimensional vector in an n-dimensional space. I'm going to choose that all these vectors go through the same origin. So there's, uh, okay, so there's, uh, right? Okay, great. There's a similar picture for the lambda tildes, but let's just stop at these for a second. Now, this isn't a given Lorentz frame, right? But Lorentz transformations act as SL2. So what does SL2 do to these vectors? Take these vectors, and under an SL2 transformation, I get some linear combination of these vectors. Okay? So the individual vectors aren't invariant, but there is something which is invariant under Lorentz transformations. What is it? It's the plane which is spanned by these two-dimensional vectors. Okay? So this is the first interesting point. It's a consequence of the fact that the Lorentz symmetry is SL2. I keep telling you SL2 is about planes. You know, these symmetries are, these are projective symmetries. They're simple linear algebra symmetries. They're about things like lines and planes and stuff like that, okay? So in this case, it's telling us that the external data is in a Lorentz invariant way actually specified by giving some two-plane lambda. Okay? Is that clear? So I draw in an n-dimensional space, and you just give me a two-plane in that n-dimensional space. So there's also a two-plane lambda tilde. So this is the Lorentz invariant data. So you see that just thinking about the external data, we're starting to talk about a pretty basic kind of object, which is a, a certain k-dimensional plane in n dimensions. Okay? It just happens to be a two-plane in n dimensions for lambda and another two-plane in n dimensions for lambda tilde. Okay? Is that plane unique in the sense that given a plane, can you reconstruct the lambda? 
Yes, of course. The, the, the plane is the lambdas. I mean, so, so you, you just give me the top vector and the bottom vector in some basis. That's right. So you just pick a basis on the plane. That basis is a particular Lorentz frame. Okay? And another basis is another Lorentz frame for the other one. Yes? Because SL2 is two by two linear transformations. Okay? That's what I'm saying. That's, that's the small clue in the structure of the symmetries we have. They're linear transformations. That's very interesting that they're linear transformations. And this picture is making heavy use of those linear transformations. In fact, there's a much bigger symmetry, which is SL4, which are also linear transformations, right? All these symmetries are linear transformations. Now, why did I draw the picture like that? It's because momentum conservation actually tells us that these planes are orthogonal to each other. Why? Because momentum conservation is a statement that the sum over A, lambda A, lambda tilde A is equal to zero. So that's true for any Lorentz component. So it tells me that if you take any vector in the lambda plane and any vector in the lambda tilde plane, they're orthogonal to each other. Okay? All right. Now, actually, there's no Euclidean structure here. What it really means is that one plane is in the complement of the other one. Okay, so there's a, there's a natural notion of the complement of a plane, uh, and one plane is in the complement of the other one. But you can think of it, it doesn't hurt to think of it as being orthogonal. So I'll use the word orthogonal, even though there's no Euclidean structure here, okay? All right, so you see this already a little bit interesting. Just the external data is associated with a two plane, some other two plane, and they're orthogonal to each other. Yes? No, there, one is in the complementary space of the other. And the, yes. That's right. All right. So this is just, uh, this is just momentum conservation. But you see that, uh, as a, uh, is that momentum conservation is a somewhat non-trivial thing. I have these planes, and there's this quadratic relation. The, the planes are orthogonal to each other. So what we're going to do is now just uh, introduce, start thinking about this momentum conservation in a slightly different way. This is a quadratic constraint on the lambdas and the lambda tildes, but often when you have nonlinear constraints, it's a useful idea to think of them as arising from sets of linear constraints. Okay, so I somehow want to linearize uh, momentum conservation. And I'm going to do that in the following way. So now something new is going to start happening. Sorry? No, they're not null. The, the, the lambdas are just random. Each lambda is a, is a random two-dimensional vector, and the lambda tildes are random two-dimensional vectors. The momenta that I built from them are automatically null, of course. That's, that's the point. But each one of them is a generic two-plane. So I have a generic two-plane and some other generic two-plane. Well, they're not generic. They're orthogonal to each other. Yeah, so, so lambdas and lambda tildes. Sorry? No, you see, so think of it like this. Let, let, let me think of it, let me just say it very concretely. So here is particle lambda one. So let's say I write each lambda a as x a, y a, okay? So here is x one, y one, x two, y two, x n, y n. So I can group them into a two by n matrix, okay? So this is just lambda one, lambda two. I've grouped them into two by n matrix. The point is that I can now think of this two by n matrix horizontally rather than vertically. I think of it as that n-dimensional vector and that n-dimensional vector. Okay? This is some n-dimensional vector. That's some other n-dimensional vector. Okay? Now, under Lorentz transformations, uh, I will go to alpha x1 plus beta y1, gamma y1 plus delta. Uh, yeah, I'll get to alpha x1 plus beta y1, gamma x1 plus delta y1 and similarly for the rest of them, okay? And so what that'll do to these vectors is change them. Well, that'll change them that one, that'll change that one, but the plane that they span will, will be the same, okay? So given a bunch of lambdas, I have, uh, I have a two-plane. The Lorentz invariant way of talking about it is a two-plane. Choosing a Lorentz frame corresponds to choosing a basis for each two-plane, okay? Any other questions about this? Okay. So what I want to do is think of momentum conservation in a slightly new way. Uh, 
Um, you might be surprised that we're going to get any mileage out of this. Uh, we're we're going to see in, in around 10 minutes, just playing with momentum conservation, we're going to 10 or 15 minutes, we'll have some expression that contains all loop information about n equals 4 super Yang mills in a way that makes all the symmetries manifest. So this is going to go pretty far in a moment. Okay? But you might wonder why there's any mileage to be made thinking about something as boring as momentum conservation. And the reason is the usual one when you're looking for dual descriptions. Things that are obvious from the usual point of view will be interesting from the dual point of view. Momentum conservation is so obvious because translational invariance is made so obvious by the presence of the intermediate space time. Okay? We have an x, there's a d4x, there's translations in x. Every expression has, has an e to the i sum of all the momenta dot x in it. That's why momentum conservation is so obvious. The whole idea is here, we're not putting in the inside of the space time. So momentum conservation is going to be a little more interesting. And thinking about it is going to be a little more interesting. Okay. okay. But now something slightly new is going to happen. I'm going to introduce a third object into the game. So just for ease of presentation, I'm collapsing the lambda 2 plane there and the lambda tilde 2 plane there. And I'm introducing a third object, which is a general k plane in n dimensions. So I'll call that ck. Okay. Right. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to demand that instead of saying lambda is orthogonal to lambda tilde directly, I'm going to demand geometrically that ck contains lambda and that ck is orthogonal to lambda tilde. Okay. Now, that clearly forces lambda and lambda tilde to be orthogonal to each other, but I'm doing it in two steps. I'm saying that there's really a third thing and they each have a relation to this third thing. Okay. So far so good? Okay. Now, you might have several complaints right away. So let's talk about some of the obvious complaints right away. One of them is that, uh, well, this is clearly nonsense. Because, for example, if k equals 0, it's a point. Or k equals 1, it's a line. There's no way that you have a point or a line that contains a two-plane. Right? So this doesn't make any sense for k equals 0 or 1. Well, in a moment, we're going to see that this k is the k of scattering amplitudes in mnk. And if you remember, I told you, and amplitudes vanish when k equals 0 or k equals 1. Okay. So that's fine. Actually, that's perfectly fine. The next thing uh, that you might complain about is that this is horribly parity asymmetric. You know, parity interchanges lambda and lambda tilde. Here I'm making lambda special, something different for lambda and lambda tilde. But it's actually perfectly parity symmetric because there's a natural isomorphism between k planes in n dimensions and there are complementary n minus k planes in n dimensions. This is exactly the same statement replacing C with its complementary k plane. C n minus k is orthogonal to lambda. And n minus k contains lambda tilde. Okay? So we're not, everything so far, so good. All right. Now, the space of k planes in n dimensions is called the Grassmannian. and is an ancient object in algebraic geometry, and is one of those things that, as a physicist, I never thought would be, sounds like one of those totally boring things that only, uh, only math geeks could like. Who the hell would care if it's something as arid and boring as a k-dimensional plane in n dimensions? But anyway, so it's called the Grassmannian g k comma n. It's a space of k planes in n dimensions. We already saw that the external data is given by a point in g2 comma n for the lambdas and a point in g2 comma n for the lambda tildes. So let's learn some very basic things about this. So uh, how would I just explicitly describe this in coordinates? How would I, how would, how would, uh, I give you a k-plane? Well, I can give you k n-dimensional vectors and say that their span makes the plane. OK, so let's do it. Here's one n-dimensional vector. Let me draw another one, another one. So this is n, OK? And I'm going to have k of them here. So this is one n-dimensional vector, another one, another one. So in fact, this is given really by a k by n matrix. Okay. Okay, I'm going to call that indices on this matrix alpha and a. a always runs from 1 to n. 
is the horizontal index, and alpha runs from 1 to k is the vertical. Okay? Now, however, this is a very redundant description of the plane. The reason is if I give you another set of k vectors that are just a k by k linear transformation on the first set, the plane is the same. So if I'm going to use these variables to describe the plane, I need to make sure that whatever I do with this k by n matrix is invariant under a GLK transformation that acts on the left. Okay? So there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of a gauge redundancy, you could call it, or a redundancy. Let's not call it gauge. There's just a redundancy, which is GLK. In other words, anything I do with this matrix has got to be invariant under doing any k by k linear transformation on that. So we can use this already to just uh, uh, count what the dimension of the space is. How many components do I have there? There's k times n components. But I have to subtract k squared from the uh, redundancy of GLK. And so I nicely get k times n minus k. This is the dimensionality of GKn. And again, because of the isomorphism, it's also the dimensionality of Gn minus Kn. Okay. Okay. And if you want to put concrete coordinates, well, concrete coordinates are very simple. Uh, what you can do is use this GLK symmetry. Now think of this, go back to thinking of it as a collection of n k, dimen uh, of n k dimensional vectors. So you can use this GLK symmetry to put any k of these vectors to anything you like. So for example, I can use it to put the first k to look like this. Okay? So the first k by k block, I can have to look like the identity matrix. And then the rest of it is in n minus k times k variables that live here. Okay? So that's a particular set of coordinates that actually covers, it's just one of the charts on the Grassmannian. Obviously, it doesn't cover the entire Grassmannian because I'm forcing all these, you know, I'm forcing all these things to be non-vanishing here. Okay? But if I, I can put those k vectors that I gauge fix anywhere I like, and the collection of all of them together covers the entire Grassmannian. Okay? Something else, uh, there's a particularly simple case, which is k equals 1. G1n is otherwise just known as a projective space, right? Because now it's just a 1 by n. Uh, matrix, which is just a vector, and the GL1 is just overall rescaling. Okay? And so this gauge choice then is just putting one in each one of the entries and is the analog of the covering the north and the south pole uh, for uh, CP1. Okay? Is this clear? All right. Now let's do a little bit more. Ah, so while we are at it, let me just say a few more things about, a few more general things about the, uh, the, uh, the Grassmannian. So remember, anything I do with this matrix C alpha A, which I can also think of as, let me write it as some vector, this column vector C1, C2 up to Cn, okay? Anything I do with this should be invariant under GLK, right? So uh, the G part of this, the G part of the GLK, just overall rescaling, is going to play a very big role in a moment. But let's just focus on the simpler part, just the SLK. Okay? What are the things that are invariant under SLK? SLK means the only tensor is the epsilon symbol, right? So the things that are invariant under SLK are you just take any K of these vectors and you epsilon them together, right? Or said you just take any K of these columns and you take the determinant of that matrix. That's called a minor of this k by n matrix, if you remember from whenever you learned these things. So we can talk about a general minor, you know, ca1, ca2, can, cak. Okay? So I'll often abbreviate the c's and just write a1, a2, up to ak. These minors are the GLK invariant, are the SLK invariants.
OK. One more thing. Well, this isn't. Uh, um, remember that we said that C should contain lambda, for example, right? Now, we know that uh, we, we just talked about Lorentz transformations on, on the lambdas, but there's another thing that we can do to each lambda separately. We can rescale each one of the lambdas separately. That was this little group action. So in order to have this picture that we talked about be compatible with that, the rescaling of each lambda separately is exactly the same as rescaling each one of these columns of C separately. Okay? Because we're saying C contains lambda. So if I rescale each, each C, it means I'm going to have to rescale each one of those vectors at the same time. So, so it's true that we have a point in the Grossmannian, but we also have something additional, which is that we have a symmetry under rescaling each column individually. So uh, sometimes our fancy math friends call this a torus action that acts on the uh, Grassmannian, just rescaling each one of the uh, uh, columns separately. Okay? That means that there is another way of thinking about this data. Totally, all these are equivalent ways of thinking about the data. So the original way is a k-plane in n dimensions. You think of it as a k-plane in n dimensions. You think about it horizontally. But we can go back to thinking of it vertically. And vertically, all I have is a collection of vectors, k-dimensional vectors, each one invariant under its own individual rescaling. That means they're really points in a projective space, pk minus 1. Okay? So I have points in a pk minus 1. So here are c1, c2, c3, c4, okay? with, a, with a GLK symmetry. Right? So that's exactly points in a projective space. Okay? So specifying, specifying a k-plane in n dimensions is equivalent, especially uh, since we're allowing identification under rescaling each column, to specifying a configuration of n points in a projective space. Do not, at this point, confuse this projective space with twister space. <laughs> okay? there, are many different, uh, there are many different projective spaces here. And actually, in the end of the day, what's going to happen is that uh, all the action is actually going on in this space. You're going to see pictures with particles and things like that in this space. And there's just a little window into this space that allows you to convert everything happening in there to functions of lambdas and lambda tildes and amplitudes. Okay? But there are two different things. It's just nice that it's all projective on all sides. But there's the, this k-dimensional space, and there's the four-dimensional projective space of twisters or momentum twisters or lambdas and lambda tildes or whatever. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's go back to the, let's go back to our picture uh, and try to say the picture in equations. Yes, I'm not going to keep writing the C. Everything is complex, so it's. Uh, How would I write down an equation that enforces this picture? So I want to write down some kind of delta functions, right? So let's write down the delta functions that says that c is orthogonal to lambda tilde. That one's easy. I write down delta squared c alpha a lambda tilde a, product over all the alphas. That just enforces that c is orthogonal to lambda tilde. Clear? This one's a little more interesting. How do I enforce that c contains lambda? Well, the way I say that something contains it is that it's possible to take, uh, what, what it means is that it's possible to take some linear combination of the vectors of c such that they're equal to the lambdas. But if I hand you C in some particular form, you have to look around to see if you can find some linear combination that makes it equal to the lambdas. So let's do that. Let's look around for them. We're going to look around for them by integrating over all the linear combinations that I can take. Okay? Now I need to take two sets of linear combinations, one to match the top component of the lambdas and one to match the bottom component of the lambdas. So I'm going to write it like this. So this has, that's, that's the, the same, that's the same uh, SL2 index that the lambdas have, 
which I, I, I could have written the a dot here. Okay. And so here what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down a delta squared of rho alpha c alpha a minus lambda a. Now this is the product over all a's. Okay. So what this is doing, what is this doing? The rho alphas, rho alpha c alpha a is just taking some linear combination. So let's pick capital A equals 1. Okay. This is says, is it possible to find some linear combination of the kc's such that it's equal to the top component of lambda? Okay. So I'm integrating over all of them. I'm looking for one that's equal to the top component of lambda, and similarly for the, for the bottom component. Okay. So that's what that picture is in equations. I mean, this thing looks a little funny, but uh, that's what it is in uh, equations. So we're done. But we're not done, because this thing needs to be invariant under GLK. If it's really going to be about the planes, it needs to be invariant under GLK. It's not invariant under the G part of GLK. Just rescaling C goes to C times a constant. Because each one of these delta functions picks up a weight under rescaling. Okay? So let's see what it picks up. I take C goes to some constant x times C. Well, it's very easy. Uh, first of all, from here, I should definitely rescale rho oppositely. Okay? So what factor do I pick up here? Well, from here, I pick up a factor of x to the minus 2k. And from here, I pick up a factor of x to the minus 2k. So I pick up an overall factor of x to the minus 4k. Tough luck. It's not invariant under the g part of GLK. See, this is something, again, an, an algebraic geometer would very naturally want to do. Talk about things that are, these are called flags. <laughs> things that are contained in things, orthogonal to things, and so on. But if you try to turn them into some analytic expressions, it's hard to do. It's hard to do because these delta functions have weights. Okay. So what's the simplest solution to this problem? Add four fermionic variables. Okay. We're going to add four fermionic variables, product over alpha delta four, C alpha A, eta tilde A, now has four indices. That gives me an x to the plus 4k. And all of a sudden, it's invariant. Okay. We've now made the system n equals 4 supersymmetric. So we started with momentum conservation. And now this thing is, has super momentum conservation, or as you'll see, is going to have super momentum conservation, and it's n equals 4 supersymmetric. By the way, of course, of course, our friends, the algebraic geometers, do this all the time, but what they do is essentially they, so something else that we could do without doing this is how, how else could I compensate for this weight? I told you there are SLK invariants that are individual minors. Take some individual minor and then raise it to the, to, to the appropriate power, raise it to the fourth. Okay? So you could do that. You could look at the collection of all the different individual minors that you can attach to this, but it breaks the symmetry of the problem. So you can do it, but uh, it's not particularly nice. Introducing supersymmetry is just a bookkeeping device. It's a generating function for all the possible ways of doing that. And that's why it's so convenient, and it's why uh, one of many reasons Deline loves it so much, although he's, uh, he's, he, he hasn't convinced most of his colleagues, I think. But uh, anyway. All right. So far, so good now? So now, now that's where supersymmetry comes in. OK. Now what else do we need to do? Um, I introduced this plane, but in general, now notice there's something very special about k equals 2. Okay? k equals 2, there's a unique k plane that contains the lambda plane, <laughs> namely the lambda plane. Okay? And similarly for k equals n minus 2, the, the conjugate one, right, by, by parity. But for general k, so k equals 0 or 1, it vanishes. n minus 1, n, it vanishes. k equals 2 and n minus 2, there is a unique plane that satisfies these properties. For general k, there's many planes. So what should we do? Ah, before I have that discussion. Sorry, sorry. Let me do one last thing before I have that, uh, before I have that discussion. Sorry. Ignore what I said for a sec. This thing looks slightly complicated. 
Um, but, and here's a, I'll leave this as a little Fourier transformation exercise for you. Okay. Take this expression for a fixed C, take this expression and Fourier transform with respect to lambda. Okay. Fourier transform, in other words, take, take this expression and we, we're now going into twister space, just the original twister space that I talked about yesterday. And I'm going to do that by Fourier transform with respect to lambda e to the i lambda mu tilde. Okay, so that's the conjugate variable. So take this expression and Fourier transform it. It is a trivial exercise in standard Fourier transformation. You Fourier represent the delta function. You interchange integration limits. What you get is surprisingly beautiful. It's the product over all the alphas of just delta 4 slash 4 C alpha A W A. Okay. Well, these W's are, again, the twister variables we talked about last time, well, the conjugate ones, but so this is some mu tilde, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. Okay. So in twister space, this is just the super statement that the plane is orthogonal to the plane of twisters, to the four plane. Again, the data in twister space is given by a four plane. There's some four plane. That's even simpler because it's just a four dimensional thing up to SLK, it's some four plane. It just says that this K plane is orthogonal to that four plane, plus its super partner, okay? But this makes something immediately obvious. This object is super conformal invariant. It's trivially invariant under SL4 slash four symmetries. Okay. That's just the linear transformations that act on the Ws. Okay. So this makes it clear this construction that we've done, that, that we've done is super conformal invariant. And furthermore, we're talking about super Yang Mills because the weights, it has vanishing weight. It's vanishing weight under rescaling Ws, which is exactly the, uh, the helicity properties, the little group properties for super Yang Mills. Okay. So this is super conformal invariant. And the kinematically, at least, we're talking about super Yang Mills. Okay. Now, let me go back uh, to what I was saying. Uh, okay. Sorry. Well, we don't see that yet. The, the, it's not. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We're, we're, we're going to see. Uh, um, so far, this is totally general. And um, I'll tell you where, where, the, where the magic happens for the dual conformal symmetry to, uh, to emerge. This is still purely kinematical. Okay? I, could have, I could have skipped the last 25 minutes and just written this expression down from, from the get-go. But, uh, um, but, but, but it's actually very important to see it both in twister space and momentum space, so I would need to go through this exercise anyway. Uh, yes? No, no, uh, there's nothing coordinate dependent about what, what, what we're doing here. In fact, in fact, uh, we're, we're trying to make everything as Lorentz and as, as uh, symmet we're making this, yeah, there's no, there's no coordinate dependence here yet. Okay. Is it, is it obvious from this kind of construction that this therefore contains all possible Yes, uh, that, that's, that, I'm coming to that in a moment. It's not obvious, but it's true. It was, it's a consequence of, some, of a theorem proven by Gelfand in the early 80s about something called radon transforms, but uh, um, yes? Sorry? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> uh, you'll, uh, well, oh, although now, now, now you see, sorry, now, now, now you do see. You see, this object uh, has 4K eta tildes in it. <laughs> Just as delta 4 slash 4 is 4k eta tilde is a bit. So at this point, you see why this k has got to be the k of uh, amplitudes. If it's going to have anything to do with amplitudes, it's got to be the k of amplitudes. Okay? You see that delta, the, the slash 4, each one of those slash 4 is 4 eta tilde is in it. So there's the product of all the alphas, so there's 4k eta tilde. So, so this thing is, has 4k eta tilde, which is the definition of k. Okay. 
So, so far, this is pure kinematics, but let, let, me, let me stress this. So, this object, delta 4 slash 4, C alpha A W A, product over alpha, which is equivalent to, I won't write the formula, but I'll, I'll often, when I need to do it, I'll often draw the picture. Okay, so this is, the, this is in twister space, this is in momentum space. Okay. That is going to be the only place the external data enters the discussion. Okay? From now on, everything is happening inside the Grassmannian. So we're going to be doing a bunch of things on this side. And this is like a window. This delta function is a window that looks into what's going on inside the Grassmannian and pulls out uh, interesting functions out of it. OK? OK. But let's go back to what I was saying a second ago. We would like to integrate over all possible Cs. Right? OK, so let's, let's do it. So again, uh, let's try the super dumbest thing first. There. I'm going to integrate over all this whole k by n matrix. OK? Why yes? Well, because, because there isn't a unique C which satisfies these, these properties. So it's reasonable. It's even unique that, that, uh, that we should integrate over them. OK? <coughs> OK? <coughs> uh, I'm going through this whole song and dance to motivate a very, very simple formula. OK? But I, I just want you to see some of the guts of it. Um, uh, OK? So we could just do that. Well, first of all, this is obviously stupid because uh, uh, before anything else, it's not G LK invariant. Okay? So let's make it a G invariant. It has a weight under C goes to XC. It has a weight X to the KN. So how, do I, how can I fix up the weights? I need to have, the only thing I have at my disposal are the minors of the matrix. Okay, I take the minors of this matrix. Each minor has a weight k. So I need n minors downstairs, roughly speaking. Right? I need n minors downstairs. So that's the kind of measure I need, is n minors downstairs. Okay? Or I could have some upstairs and more downstairs. The most general thing I could have is some function of, some function of c here with, with the appropriate weight. Now, let me come to David's point. What's possible to prove, it's not trivial, it's not very complicated, but it's not trivial, is that any super conformal invariant can be written as an integral of some function of c times delta 4 slash 4 c dot w. Okay? So that's, uh, that's, that's another way that Grassmannians just enter. It's not obvious a priori, but it's just the representations theory of the super conformal uh, of things that are super, super conformal invariant, OK? Yeah, the statement is that any super conformal invariant, any function of these w's, which is invariant under SL4 slash 4, can be expressed as an integral over the Grassmannian with so any some measure, random measure, OK? Uh, as long as it has the appropriate weights. But this, this is the important part. The, all the dependence on the external world enters in this form, delta 4 slash 4 c dot w. This is a very surprising statement. Because if I just asked you for conformal invariants, there is a huge zoo of conformal invariants. Okay? You can just take any cross ratios, okay? and there's a gigantic zoo of normal conformal invariants. It's the super part, which is so hard. Okay? It's, if you just take a random function of cross ratios and try to make it super symmetric, you will fail. You try to make it super symmetric by adding some etas and make it, you'll fail. That's, that is the claim. The super part is amazingly constraining. It's so, it, it, yeah, anyway. And, and, the, and the, 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 there's a reason why sort of so many people ran into this kind of structure, because if you're playing with things that are super conformal invariant, you're going to put them in some form, and they kept coming out in this form. You sort of wonder why they keep coming out in that form. Well, there's no other way they can actually be written. So this is a, a non-trivial fact. Okay. okay. But it also means something uh, that, that if I write down a random thing, all I'm guaranteed to get is something which is super conformal invariant. Okay? So now, yes? Uh, oh, let, we'll come to interpreting it in a second. Okay? So, so just, just hold, 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 hold your horses. Uh, uh, yes. So 
now we're going to make a choice. So here there's just some choice of a, just the simplest possible measure that we could write down there. Okay? And remember that, remember that whatever we're doing, if it's going to be connected to amplitudes in the planar limit, it should have a nice cyclic symmetry. One to two, two to three. Okay? So keep that in mind. Keeping in mind that there's got to be a cyclic symmetry, what's, what's the, that means that the simplest way of making it cyclic is to write down some minor here and just write down all of its cyclic images. Okay, so that would make it cyclic. So now we still have a choice to make. What minor should we start with? So what's the simplest choice you could make for the minor to start with? It's the first K. Okay. All right, so let's do it. Just take the product of all the cyclic minors of the first k by k, the next k by k, and so on. Okay? Now, finally, this thing is GLK invariant. And so this is the measure. In fact, this is the measure modulo GLK. I have to mod out by a GLK. Once again, modding out by GLK in practice just means in any chart, you just fix k of the columns to be this identity matrix. And then the measure is just the product of all the other ones, the D of all the other ones, OK? All right, so let's call this object L and K of the Ws, OK? And now we are done, OK? So actually, so, so again, as I said, so this part kind of lives purely in the Grassmannian. And this is the way the external world learns about it. And it learns about it in twister space through this thing, in momentum twister space, in momentum space, just, just through the picture that we started off drawing. OK. That's the simplest thing, but not the only thing. Well, of course, it's not the only thing. Purely from this point of view, it is not the only thing. Okay? In, when, I start talking about the, uh, when I start talking about things from the other point of view, we're going to understand what this object is. Here, we're just guessing it. There's something nice. Looks pretty. This object has a completely invariant meaning. Okay? Uh, uh, there is a space in the Grassmannian. There's a part of the Grassmannian known as the positive part. And this form is a unique form that has singularities on the faces of the positive part of the Grassmannian. So that's what it ends up being. It has completely invariant definition. Uh, um, and uh, anyway, that, that'll be part of what I'm saying, what I'll, what I'll go to next. Um, but for the moment, I'm just introducing, uh, just introducing some of these objects. Now, the claim is that this formula knows everything about n equals 4 super Yang mills to all loop orders. Okay. And let's, uh, uh, you have to appropriately interpret it. If Yaron asks, there are all these singularities downstairs, yes, we interpret this as a contour integral and we compute residues. Okay. So what we do is we compute residues of this object. No, there's zillions of choices of contours, and we get zillions of objects. Okay? Those, objects are, uh, those objects turn out to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with all the leading singularities of n equals 4 super Yang mills. Okay? But before seeing that, uh, I will show you in a moment that this thing is also dual conformal invariant. Uh, and in fact, what this object is is a generating function for all Yangian invariants. So it answers the mathematical physics problem of find all Yangian invariants. All Yangian invariants are residues of this integral. And furthermore, it tells you all the relations between the Yangian invariants. There's highly non-trivial algebraic relations between the Yangian invariants, which are a consequence of residue theorems for this big contour integral. Although it all has a much nicer geometric interpretation, which I will start telling you about next time. Uh, uh, that, that needs that, the theorem of Gilfond is needed as an ingredient to show that, first of all, just superconformal invariants are, are of this form. Then you can show that for it to be Yangian invariant, invariant under the dual uh, transformations, that the measure is this measure uniquely. Okay? That's, that's in that direction. But, but well, the, the, there, there's a unique measure. There's a unique measure, which is, so you can talk just in one space. You have conformal transformations, which are in these variables, W, D, D, W. The Yangian, the dual conformal symmetry in the original space is given by these level one generators. You don't need to know what this is. But the level one generators that are the sum over i less than j of the commutator of w, d, d, w, w, d, d, w. So you take that object, you hit it on this with a random measure, and you find that it's only invariant up to a total derivative. 
if you have exactly that measure. Okay? Yes. Nope. Nope. No, let's, let's, let's come to that point later. As I said, there, there, there's this perfectly invariant object, the integrand, the leading singularities, there's just a free Yangian, perfect, no modification. Okay? I don't want to spend so much time talking about the symmetries and stuff like that, because the, the point here is to write down the answer, right? And not just find the symmetries and, and impose them and so on. So we're going we're gonna to write down the answer. I mean, I haven't told you how to interpret it yet. I'll tell you in a moment, uh, in a bit, how we're actually going to interpret it. But uh, let me just, uh, just as a very quick sanity check though, let's go back for the case of k equals two. Okay, in k equals two, what does this formula look like? Let's just go back to a momentum space. It's a d two times n c over one two two three n one, and then there are these delta functions that enforce this this picture that we just said, right? I won't write it explicitly. But you see, these are minors of the two by two matrix, right? Now, this delta function tells me that the C two plane is the lambda two plane. That's one of them, right? So when the C plane is equal to the lambda plane, the product of these cyclic minors downstairs becomes exactly the angle bracket one, two, two, three, up to N one. And the delta function that says it's orthogonal to lambda tilde and orthogonal to eta tilde just becomes a delta function for momentum conservation and super momentum conservation. And that's how we just get the MHV tree amplitude. Okay. So you see, for k equals 2, there's no choice. We get one object out of this, just the MHV tree amplitude. Okay. You might say, doesn't that sound, but how can this possibly know anything about all loops or anything like that? All we ever get for k equals 2 is, the, is, this, uh, is this trivial object. Uh, how is that consistent? I mean, now I'm telling you in the beginning that these residues, and here there isn't even a residue because just, it's just nailed, that these residues just compute leading singularities. You say, okay, that's, that's, that's crazy. Let me draw a 100 loop diagram. And I calculate leading singularities. I glue these white and blacks together like we said last time, the 100 loops to make the overall k equals 2. How the hell can it be that, that it, there's just one object here? Well, that's the point. There's just one object. That's one, of the, that's one of the big surprises in Feynman diagrams. You would think there's millions of objects, but when you actually compute them, you find the same object over and over again, and it's this one. Okay? So this is one of the miracles, in, even in leading singularities. Leading singularities, and people had noticed this, they run out, and it's very strange. Oh, you would think it's very complicated. You just keep getting the same objects over and over again. And that's totally obvious from this point of view, because it's obvious that for any, it's obvious for any NNK, there's a finite number of objects that we're talking about, period. Okay. All right, now, in the next lecture, at least first part of the next lecture, before I start talking about the Higgs, I will explain where all this comes from without any guessing or, you know, what the structure is that's behind this. In particular, th th this, th these look like all sorts of funny choices that are being made. Cyclicity is very important, all sorts of funny choices. We'll see what, primitive structure is underlying all of this, okay? Um, but anyway, but, but what I want to do just, uh, do I have 10 minutes before the end? Okay. What I want to do now is show you why this thing is dual conformal invariant, okay? All right, so let's, let's, let's go back. And let me write the, uh, let me write again, let me write it again in the form of the uh, delta functions uh, that say that it's orthogonal to lambda tilde, super orthogonal to eta tilde, and contains Lambda. Okay. Let me just give you the sketch, uh, the sketch of the argument. Um, well, it's, actually, it's it's really the argument. The, 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 it's a very very simple argument, but I don't want to get bogged down in uh, writing writing uh, a lot of integrals. Uh, what's 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 the geometry here? So what we're being instructed to do is integrate over k planes that contain lambda and are orthogonal to lambda tilde. Now, you, you look at this and say, this is really stupid. 
I'm forcing this thing, for example, to contain the lambda plane. So why am I integrating over all k planes? It has to contain lambda. Let's make it contain lambda. So I should really be integrating over k minus two planes, uh, which are orthogonal to lambda and lambda tilde. That's really what I should do. And if I do that, I start making it look more symmetrical between lambda and, and, and lambda tilde. So why am I doing this idiot thing? Okay. Well, let's do that. It's very simple to, uh, to uh, do that. So the idea is that precisely because of this, uh, this uh, delta function, it is possible to choose that C, the top two rows of C, for example, just look like lambda. Right? Then we have the, then we have the uh, bottom n minus two rows. Okay? So there's two rows here, and we, uh, we have the bottom k minus two rows. Okay? Let me call the bottom guys c hat. Formally, the way you can do that is that there's this GLK. The GLK, uh, in this form, the GLK also acts on the row. You see the row has the opposite uh, uh, index as, as alpha. So what I can do is gauge fix rho to look like 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so rho has two indices. These are the two indices and these are the k. Right? And what this is doing is precisely saying that the top row of c should be the top row of lambda and the bottom row of c should be the bottom row of lambdas. Okay? Now if I do that, I've broken the glk down to a glk minus 2. That's good, because if I want to think of the remaining integral as an integral over k minus 2 planes, it'll be useful to have that redundancy of glk minus 2. There's a little bit more redundancy, which is translations in the direction of the lambdas. Okay? Just think of the k by k matrices that annihilate that. Just the, I can still translate any of the other c's by anything proportional to the lambdas. Okay? So let's call that glk minus 2 cross t2 for translations, those, those two translations in the direction of the lambdas. OK, great. So let's, let's just remember that. Now, I really want to go down to GLK minus 2. So, uh, so what I should do is put in another gauge fixing that gauge fixes that T2. The most convenient way to do that is to say that the C hat matrix that I just erased is actually orthogonal to lambda. Just the thing that we said to begin with, right? It's actually ortho we want it to be orthogonal to a lambda. So this integral, now, now notice something else that nice happens. Since the top two rows of C have turned into lambda, some of these products over lambda tilde and eta tilde I can just take out. They've just turned into lambda. And what I just take out is just momentum conservation and super momentum conservation. So when I do that, I get delta 4, the sum of lambda, lambda tilde, delta 8, the sum of lambda, eta tilde. There are some Jacobian factors here that I'm not going to bother putting in until the very end. But now what I'm left with is precisely an integral over dk minus 2 times n C hat. Now I just have, now I just have, uh, I just have the integral over the remaining alphas. So let me, let me call the remaining alphas alpha hat as well. So it's the k minus two alphas. So there's k minus two alpha hats. Okay. The product over alpha hat. There's the delta squared c dot c hat dot lambda tilde, delta four c hat dot eta tilde. Those were there before. Plus, there's one more delta function, alpha hat, which is delta squared of c dot lambda, c hat times dot lambda. This is, from, this is from gauge fixing. This is gauge fixing this t2, saying that c hat should be, uh, should be orthogonal to <coughs> lambda. Okay? And what I have downstairs here, still in the measure, is the, still the measure hasn't changed. 1, 2 up to k and 1 up to k minus 1. But now I have a 1 over, this is mod glk minus 2. So let me put a 1 over G, vol glk minus 2. Okay. So this is the most naive thing. You look and say, oh, it's forced to contain lambda, so let's just do it. Let's make it, let's make it contain lambda. You see, this is already starting to look nice. We've taken out momentum conservation, the trivial part. And what's left inside is starting to treat, it almost looks like, hey, lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. If you just stare at the delta functions, it's like, oh my god, there's a new SL4 symmetry. Right? It looks like lambda and lambda tilde are unified into a little 4 vector. There's that guy, and there's a new SL4 slash 4 symmetry. 
there's a brand new conformal symmetry here, right? That's fantastic. But not quite. There's something, there's a small fly in the ointment. The fly in the ointment is, that would be true if this measure only depended on C hat. But it doesn't. It remembers that it, that it depends on C. And remember, the lambdas occur in the C matrix. Okay? The lambdas are the top components of the C matrix. So it's almost true, but not quite. It's a good thing because none of this argument so far depended on what the measure was. Okay? So I would do this no matter what the measure is. I would get something that looks like, oh, it's almost conformal invariant under a new conformal symmetry, but oh, it's not going to be true in general because the general measure won't make it happen. But this measure allows it to happen. And not only does it allow it to happen, it also forces you to invent the linear transformation from the lambda, lambda tilde variables to the momentum twister variables and discover the correct SL4 symmetry. Let's see how that happens. To see how that happens, you say, wouldn't it be a great thing? Oh, too bad this didn't work. But it really would have worked if it turns out that these minors somehow are, are, can be given in terms of k minus 2 by k minus 2 minors rather than k by k minors. Right? That would be great if you could do it. Well, there's a trick that you all remember from, uh, uh, well, maybe you don't remember anymore because people do everything on computers. But when you have to compute determinants by hand, uh, there's, this, there's this trick for how to compute determinants, right? The, 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 the trick is that you take a matrix and then you take linear combinations of, for example, adjacent rows, adjacent columns, so that you put a zero in, the, in, in all but one of the, uh, in, in, in all but the top one. And then after you do that, the, the, the big determinant is just equal to whatever that number is times the little determinant, right? Well, there's a, you can do that also to, uh, you can also do that trick to take the matrix, take each row, take a linear combination of adjacent rows to make the top two rows equal to zero. Then you have a little two vector at the end, little two vector at the end, and the big k by k matrix is equal to that little determinant times the k minus two by k minus two matrix, right? So let's, let's look at that linear transformation. Just on the C's, what is that linear transformation? It says, you know, what I should look at is not the C's, but the D's. D alpha A. And I should make D alpha A be some linear combination of C A, A minus 1, and A plus 1, such that the top two rows of this D matrix are equal to 0. That's a very simple exercise in expanding a vector as a sum of a two-dimensional vector as two other two-dimensional vectors, and this is the answer. starting to look a little familiar, perhaps. Now, of course, here I could multiply by any constant that I like. Let me, for convenience, normalize it. Let me, for convenience, normalize it to be a minus 1 a, a, a plus 1. Okay? Now we're in business. Because now it turns out, and now it's absolutely crucial that the minors that appear here are these consecutive ones. Okay? Because with the single linear transformation, I make it possible for the product of all these minors to actually be given by the product of all the k minus 2 by k minus 2 minors. Okay? But now these delta functions are no longer going to be this delta. So see, notice that delta squared of c hat dot lambda is actually wonderfully delta squared of d dot lambda. Okay? That's precisely the condition that the top two rows, which were lambda, were set to 0 by the d's. But but we see that, uh, that the delta squared of c hat times lambda tilde uh, is equal to, now, uh, there, okay. There's a small point here, which is that I can't, I can't actually invert. Uh, Precisely because I've set the, 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 the top column to zero, I can't so I can, given C's, I can get D's, but not the other way around, right? However, uh, so let, 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 me, let me write this. 
Let me write this like d alpha a is equal to some q a b. d alpha b is some q a b c alpha a. Okay? q a b is just given by this thing. And nicely putting this normalization there makes q a b symmetric. Now the whole point is that q a b lambda b is equal to zero. Okay? So that's really that was really its 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 point. But it means that I cannot solve, precisely because of that, I can't invert. I can't, I can't solve for the Cs in terms of the Ds, right? However, precisely because QAB lambda B equals 0, on the support, okay, on, 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 on the support of that delta function that we just, momentum conserving delta function that we stripped off, it's very natural to define lambda tilde A is equal to QAB mu B. That guarantees that lambda A, lambda tilde A is equal to 0. Okay? I'm stressing this QAB came from our desire to go from K by K matrices to K minus 2 by K minus 2 matrices, right? With this choice, now I can invert, okay? In other words, the, the, the lack of inversion is precisely the, the freedom here that I have. But if I fix the choice for the mu's, now, now I can invert. And of course, c hat dot lambda tilde becomes d dot mu. Okay? So now what do we have? Now what we have is an integral d k minus 2 d over k minus 2 by k minus 2 minors, a product over k minus 2 alphas of a delta squared, which is d dot mu, a delta squared, which is d dot lambda tilde, and the same linear transformation, sorry, I should have also said eta tilde is equal to qab a to b, d dot eta. Okay. Now the little excitement that we had right at the beginning is realized. Because now we discover there's a brand new conformal symmetry. So in fact, we rediscovered momentum twisters. No one had ever told us about them. We rediscovered them. And if we, there, sorry, there are all these, there was also this, there's the delta 4 of momentum conservation, the delta 8 of its superpartner. There are some Jacobian. When you work out all the Jacobians, of course, what you find is that the original object that we had, LNK, which was, we, st we started off, we started off from, from twister space, we took it to momentum space. This becomes equal to delta 4, the sum of a lambda lambda tilde, delta 8, sum of lambda eta tilde over 1, 2, and one times an integral that looks exactly of the same structure, but with k minus two by k minus two minors. Of the product over alpha delta four slash four d dot the momentum twister variable z. Okay. So the geometry forced us to discover this simple, trivial geometry of planes. One plane contains another plane. You see that one plane contains a two plane. You try to, to geometrically realize the integral that you had as an integral of the space of k minus two planes in n dimensions. You find for a random measure that this is hopeless. But for this very special measure with the cyclic minors, something beautiful happens, and it works. But the process of making the k by k minors turn into k minus 2 by k minus 2 minors forces you to do a linear, linear transformation that precisely takes you from momentum lambda lambda tilde variables to momentum twister variables. And the new object that, that we discover has enjoys its new SL4 slash 4 symmetry, which is the dual conformal invariant. Okay? Not only do we see its dual conformal invariant, we see it's exactly the same object, okay? precisely the same object. Just k goes to k minus 2. Oh, no, J, yeah, J ends up being, ends up giving you the rest of this factor downstairs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. statement that the three amplitude is both invariant under conformal and dual conformal. 
Yes, that's right. Are you making a statement also about Luxie? Yes, the entire integrand. The entire integrand is invariant under everything. It's probably then tricky because the issue that. It's not, not only is it not tricky, since we've written down the entire integrand, we can, and we see precisely how it comes from these. Yeah. No, sorry, that, uh, I thought you were talking about the loop integrand, right? Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no, I was yeah. asking whether this is also a statement about a loop scattering application. Yes, and absolutely, it's a well, statement about the entire I, theory. It's again, I'm puzzled, yeah. because how, the, how do you take into account the fact that uh, this Youngian symmetry or this dual conformal symmetry is actually modified? Otherwise, it's not modified <laughs> at the level of the integrand. He hasn't done the integrand. I haven't, I haven't done the integrals yet. The claim is that there is, set, there is an object in the theory called the integrand of the scattering amplitude. The integrand is completely invariant under the free Yangian symmetry. Okay? And, 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 and let me just, just finish saying something about this, because really, this part is actually really interesting. When you go to do the integrals, what, I mean, it's really astonishing that you can find something that's, that's Yang. I mean, if someone just told you, that, that this, is, this is why I, I mean, it's a, it's a somewhat philosophical difference. Because some people like to say we have symmetries and we impose the symmetries to get the answer, right? I prefer to write down the answer and observe if it has some, some symmetry or not. And part of the reason is that, uh, uh, part of the reason is if you try to go the other way, it's really, really hard. It's a lot of hard work to sit down. And in fact, it's so hard, no one had done it, even in the most trivial cases, okay? So never mind getting, getting all of them, right? No one had done it in that forward direction, even in the most trivial cases. Sorry? No, 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 of course I agree. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, this is not, th th this was not meant to be, uh, it, it, it was not, it wasn't meant to be taken in the way you're, you're, you're taking it. I'm, I'm not saying there's anything awesome about it. I'm just saying that, that it's a second point of view. Uh, but, no, great, I, 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 I totally agree. But, 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 the reason I, but the reason I mention it, the specific reason I mention it, is you write down the answer and you discover something amazing about it. That, roughly speaking, you get this integrand, this beautiful rational function. It's invariant under conformal and dual conformal symmetry. It's invariant as the integrand is a statement that it's up to a total derivative, of course. So you, uh, so great, it's sitting there. The way that it's invariant is sort of remarkably, it's not obvious, but the integrand is a total derivative. You do all this work, you, roughly speaking, you do all this work to construct this fantastic integrand, this Yangian invariant, and it's actually a total derivative. So, oh, so you did all this work and it's zero. You would find that, for example, if you went and tried to compute the integrals in two comma two signature. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Well, roughly speaking, that's right. So it's uh, of right. That's, away from that's the point. Right. Then that's right. Why is it Absolutely. So this is no, no. So exactly. So exactly. So, but this is exactly where I'm going. So the integrand is beautiful. It's invariant. It's so invariant that it's almost a total derivative, basically. And then if you went and computed, actually tried to do the integrals in two comma two signature, you'd be fine. You'd get zero. But in three comma one signature, there are pinches. There's and and so these total derivatives don't integrate to zero. But they also tell you why the answer is so simple. Because it's not this big, complicated, four-dimensional, eight-dimensional, 12-dimensional integral at one, two, three loops. It's localized to much smaller, lower-dimensional regions where these pinches happen. That's a rough statement that is taking a long time to turn into a theory for getting polylogs and even more complicated elliptic integrals and so on out of these objects. But I suspect it's going to happen. Okay? That, uh, so, so, but that, that's why I'm saying there, there's value to, to seeing that the object that you begin with there's value to talking about this, this integrand. So you see that it's sitting there and it's basically a total derivative. And the whole amplitude is an anomaly. The entire non-trivial part of the loop amplitudes is, in a sense, an anomaly. And what's fascinating is that it's an anomaly that's only there in 3-1 signature. So you, you go through all this work to generate this uh, integrand, but only in a space-time with a, with, a, with a time direction can you get any non-trivial quantum amplitudes? I find that connection between causality on the one hand and non-trivial quantum amplitudes on the other hand very, very, very interesting. If you did it in a, in a in two comma two signature, you'd get zero. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. But so, but 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 forget about if we forget about that, all of the leading singularities. So so that's going back to the integrand and computing every single one of its residues. Okay? In principle, if I just told you go and do that, you think there's an infinite class of those objects. At every loop order, right? there's an infinite class of those objects. 
This is what you would find. What you'd find if you went and did that exercise in n equals four superangles in the planar limit is you'd find for MHV, at any loop order, you always get the same answer. And it's the MHV tree amplitude. If you do it for NMHV, for six particles, you'd find six objects. All the, always the same six objects over and over again. Okay? So you do it for any N and K, independent of loop order, you'd find a finite number of objects. You'd have to work hard. You'd have to go to six, seven, nine, 15 but loops. But no, 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 that's not the leading singularity. The, 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 the leading singularity is one totally invariant definition is take, take the integrand and compute its, all of its singularities, all of its residues. Another way of seeing it from the actual answer is the coefficient of the polylogs that's in front of the answer. So that's the, uh, that, is, that is another way of getting it, okay? But, 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 do you want but, to give the next speaker a 10 minute break? Oh, sure, yes, yes, uh, yes. So, um, yeah, but, but, but sorry, let me, just, let, me just, let me just finish the answer to this question and then we can, sure. Sure, but, uh, but, but just, just, just to finish this, so, so the claim is that there's that suite of objects. So you can go write down all the, make a big list of those objects. You start getting shocked that they run out after a finite number of loops, but you make a big list of those objects. You put them on the left-hand side. Now the claim is forget about quantum field theory. You're staring at this object, okay? You compute all of its residues. Now it's obvious there's a finite number of them. Now it looks like hard work to go compute these residues. It looks pretty nonlinear with all those miners downstairs, and that's roughly the problem that we, we were working on for, for a long time. But you start learning what that looks like. There's some geometry in the Grassmannian that it corresponds to. You start making a big list of what all the residues look like on the right-hand side. The claim is those are in one-to-one -one correspondence with each other. Okay. <coughs> so that's the, that. And so every leading singularity is individually a Yangian invariant object. Still all planar. Yeah. yeah, still all planar, yes, right. Well, here there's obviously not uh, an infinite number of objects for, for fixed n and k, but for but from but from Feynman diagrams, yeah, from. Oh, of course, no. In that sense, there's a there. No, no. I sorry. I meant for no. Uh, what I really meant is that for any for a fixed number of particles in k, it has nothing to do with loop order. That, that you could go to infinitely many loops and you have a uh, you have a finite number of objects. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 